Sociological Theories of Crime, Part 1. One thing that's important to remember before we go any farther is that the social definition of what constitutes a crime and or a deviant behavior can change rapidly. A crime is an act committed or omitted in violation of public law. That's taken from Black's Law Dictionary. Note that you can break the law either through the commission of an act, killing or stealing, for example, or the omission of one. If someone has a baby and doesn't feed it and it gets taken away by the state, you've still broken the law through child neglect. Deviance, on the other hand, is a term which just means behavior that violates the social norms or social expectations of a given culture and arouses negative social reactions. Deviant behaviors aren't always crimes, and they don't always cause negative reactions in everybody. This vintage postcard of a circus performer, a tattooed lady, recalls a time when getting your body inked was definitely considered deviant or unusual, especially for women. Enough so that many tattooed ladies turned their love of body modification into a career, traveling with carnivals or circuses and being paid just to take off most of their clothes and let people look at them. The fact that it was also an opportunity for carnival goers to pay a few coins to look at a nearly naked woman probably didn't hurt sales either. Laws and norms are highly culturally specific and can be extremely fluid, sometimes changing dramatically in relatively short periods of time. What is deviant or even criminal in one place and time can be legal and socially acceptable in another, as this photo taken from a lunch counter sit-in in Mississippi during the Civil Rights Era demonstrates. In Jim Crow states like Mississippi and also Texas, social mixing of blacks and whites was prescribed or prohibited by law. Violating these norms led to harassment. Here you see civil rights protesters having sugar and other condiments poured on their heads by members of an angry crowd. Arrest, imprisonment, and even murder. In the span of 60 or so years, though, we've seen laws change dramatically. Now any business owner who tried to refuse service on account of race would himself both be breaking the law and violating social norms. Early schools of thought on the ideology of crime were nearly as varied as they are now. Some looked to social factors, others to individual level ones, with many explanations fo focusing heavily on framings of crime that equated it with sin. Sin was used to explain norm-violating behavior, but also used as an explanation for other poorly understood phenomena, such as physical disease. Religious or supernatural explanations began to lose some favor with the advent of the so-called Age of Enlightenment in the 15 and 1600s, although they certainly didn't go away, as evidenced by later moral panics such as the Salem Witch Trials. Nevertheless, the Enlightenment, sometimes called the Age of Reason, saw a shift toward a positivistic theories of both human behavior and natural events. Positivism is a philosophical system that holds that rationally justifiable assertions can be scientifically verified or are capable of logical or mathematical proof. It therefore rejects supernatural or faith-based arguments. Positivism and criminology look to new scientific theories to explain, to explain crime. Not all of those were based on good science, though, like the theory of phrenology, developed by German physician Franz Joseph Gall. Gall believed that the brain was a collection of interrelated glands, which each being responsible for a specific ability or facet of character or personality. Gall further believed that the brain and skull would expand to be larger and stick out farther in areas where the individual had more of a certain trait, and be smaller or sort of sunken in in areas with less fully developed traits. So a criminal might have bulges right behind the ears where the traits for destructiveness and combativeness were both located, but a little crater just at the front about the hairline where kindness was. You'd think that attributing critical, criminal behavior to the shape of someone's skull would make people more sympathetic to criminals. It's not their fault they have a bulge where they do, but no. In time, practices like phrenology were revealed to be nothing more than what we call pseudoscience, something that uses scientific terminology to build an argument that is actually utter nonsense. Still, the idea that criminal behavior could be investigated and researched like any other physical or social phenomenon caught on. Sociological Perspectives on Crime We've already gone over the big three sociological theories, but it's worth delving into them again because they can help us organize some of the schools of thought about crime put forward by sociologists, psychologists, and other social science and mental health practitioners. This particular lecture will focus on looking at crime through the lens of the functionalist perspective, 
Functionalism sees society as a complex system whose parts work together to promote stability. Functionalists tend to take an almost evolutionary view of social institutions. If they contribute to social stability or do enough good for enough people, they will continue. If they stop helping society in some way, they will die out. Adherents to the functionalist perspective might argue that criminal behavior is caused by the breakdown of necessary social institutions. Or, contrarily, they might argue that certain kinds of crime aren't dysfunctional at all, that they exist because they meet the needs of society in some real way. In this respect, even things that seem dysfunctional may continue from generation to generation. One of the things that sociological theories of crime have always sought to explain is why cities have higher crime rates than rural areas. The rate, remember, is a measure of the number of, say, robberies per capita, so it takes population size into account. Foundational sociologist Emil Durkheim was interested in the phenomenon of urbanization, which was really marked during his lifetime. As the economy changed and industrialized throughout the 18 and early 1900s, people, especially young people, began moving away from the small farming towns in which their families had lived for generations, and into the cities that were springing up around the new factories. There were jobs there, and also freedom. In a big city, you weren't under the constant watchful eye of your parents, aunts and uncles, or dozens of other busybodies who made it their business to keep eyes on you. Young people who moved away from home to a big anonymous city could go out drinking or dancing after work. They decided who to befriend or date. Even people their parents might have seen as bad influences. Maybe they stopped going to church, temple, mosque, or synagogue. That freedom and lack of social control could be liberating, but for some people it could also be dangerous. Periods of massive social change and upheaval tended to create, Durkheim argued, a sense of anomie in individuals. Basically, old rules and norms cease to be followed, but new ones don't immediately rise to take their place. And so society itself ceases to impose expectations on people. During such periods, Durkheim said, we see a rise in crime, chaos, and even suicide rates. With no social expectations in place, people lose a sense of purpose and direction. Societies, according to this theory, need some norms, rules, and laws, as well as strong social ties with other people. That helps us behave better, gives us direction and purpose, and also makes us feel seen and cared for. Building off of Durkheim's theory of anomie, Robert Merton argued that society's rules could encourage criminal behaviors in other ways too. Merton argued that a society that held out the same key set of goals for all of its members, but didn't offer them all equal pathways to achieve those goals, could see the same breakdown in social order. For example, our culture often tells young people that being rich is the same thing as being successful in life, and that being wealthy means you are better than other people, more talented than other people, and more deserving of respect. But not everyone gets rich, no matter how hard they work. That disconnect between what the culture calls for and what the structure actually permits can cause individuals to feel or exhibit strain. Criminals, Merton argued, weren't lacking morals. Many street criminals had internalized the same morality as successful businessmen, get rich or die trying, but they had, more, they had to be more innovative to pursue them. I think this picture from a Tumblr entitled Annoying Rich Kids of Instagram is a good example of this. You see this kid with bottles of champagne and strategically posted credit cards in what is probably supposed to be a hot tub, but actually looks like a normal bathtub. If this is the image of success and social value that society holds up to kids, it's not surprising that some will try to achieve this end goal through criminal means. Merton argued that there were essentially five different ways an individual could react to a social goal. For example, your society tells you financial success is the key to happiness, respect, and self-worth. So, how do you respond? Most people fit into the first category, conformists. A conformist accepts both the culturally defined goals, get rich, and the rules for pursuing those goals, stay in school and work hard. In contrast, the innovator accepts culturally defined goals, get rich, but does not necessarily follow the rules for achieving them. Step one, become drug dealer. Step two, profit. By the way, I do not allow AI-generated writing in my course, and I do not use it myself. I never have. But I do subscribe to and use an AI-generated illustrator because I am not a graphic designer and I do not pretend to be one. So some of these illustrations are provided by the open art application. Also, I just think it's funny that this is what AI thinks a drug dealer looks like. Finally, that bit about becoming a drug dealer and profiting is a joke.
don't do drugs, kids. The third adaptation, The Ritualist, also probably describes a lot of us. The Ritualist has given up on achieving society's goals, but has internalized the rules and still follow them. They get up every day, go to work, and keep doing that until they die. That could be sad, or it could simply reflect someone who follows the rules and works to earn a living, but manages to find fulfillment elsewhere. The Retreatist rejects both the goals of societies and the rules. Maybe she retreats into drugs or alcoholism, or maybe she builds herself a little cabin in the woods somewhere in homesteads. The writing on retreatism often assumes it's a negative adaptation, but not necessarily. The person who has rejected both the norm to pursue wealth and conventional success and the expectation that she work 60-hour weeks at a desk job to get them might be far happier. Finally, the rebel, the last adaptation, says no in a bigger way. She believes the goals and the rules are both wrong and toxic. She tries to carve out an alternative set of goals for herself, and she also fights for social change. Strain theory may help to explain some variations in crime rates between countries. For example, many criminologists look at differences between countries to try to understand factors that drive crime. Criminologists are particularly interested in why crime rates in nations like Japan and South Korea are so low in comparison to the United States. Some point to differences in cultural values. The U.S. is a very individualistic culture. We tend to value individual success at all costs. The ends justify the means. If you're not first, you're last. We lionize rich and successful people, even if they did bad things to get there. Japan and South Korea are more communitarian culturally. In a communitarian culture, the interests of the individual may be seen as more secondary to the needs of the group, the family, the team, or society as a whole. There's more of an emphasis on pulling your weight, working together, being a team player, and respecting others. Also something of a shame culture. Your actions are seen to reflect more heavily on the rest of your family. So if you break the law and get into trouble, that's an embarrassment to your whole family in a deeper way, perhaps, than it is here. Your parents might suffer real social consequences for it, as do your siblings. These basic differences in cultural values could affect a lot of behaviors, including the likelihood of engaging in crime. Anime theory can also work together with similar sets of theories about so-called deviant places, like this one, social disorganization theory. Theories about deviant or criminogenic places argue that it's not the people of a high crime community themselves that are bad, so much as the place itself is dysfunctional. We know that communities vary in crime rates, with low-income, crowded urban neighborhoods having especially high rates of reported property and violent crime, and this is regardless of who lives there. Theorists in this school of thought tend to look more closely at the kinds of factors in the individual neighborhood cultures that might push high or medium risk individuals into crime. Social disorganization theory argues that a large part of the problem is, like with Durkheim's theory of anomie, a breakdown in social control. In a crowded but anonymous urban neighborhood, there just aren't as many people looking out for you, and this can be especially problematic for teenagers. Parents may be working long hours, incarcerated or just gone, if there are other social institutions in place where caring adults can step in, that might not be so bad. But what if those social institutions disappear or are overwhelmed? There's no church, synagogue, temple, or mosque community looking out for kids. No after-school clubs. Not even in any watchful neighbors. Neighbors actually play a big role in stopping crime. You know how in some communities you have those nosy old folks who sit on their front porch all day glaring at the local kids and gossiping? Those people are real crime stoppers, actually. This is Miss Edna. Miss Edna is watching you. She knows who your mama is, and if you step out of line, she's going to call her. Miss Edna and the millions of nosy neighbors uh, nationwide can be annoying sometimes, but they serve a real social function in a healthy community because being watched out for helps keep people in line. But in many high-risk neighborhoods, people don't sit on their porches, talk to their neighbors, or even stay very long. Eviction rates and residential turnover are really high, too. Those crime-stopping, nosy old folks hide inside their apartments and don't come out. In a vacuum of legitimate or stable adult authority, kids tend to be more likely to seek out social connections through deviant groups like street gangs. Most crime theories are good at explaining some types of crime, but not all of them. And social disorganization theory is no, uh, is no exception there. It might help to explain juvenile and sometimes of adult crime, for example, but not do much to help us understand, say, cybercrime.
that's okay. Crime is as diverse as the people who do it, and no one theory will probably ever explain all types. Building off of social disorganization theory, criminologists and psychologists like James Q. Wilson, George Kelling, and Philip Zimbardo began advocating for something they called broken windows theory. Basically, they argued that social disorder in the form of vandalism like broken windows and graffiti and in the form of petty crimes like drinking or gambling on the street had a norm-setting influence on vulnerable neighborhoods. It signaled that people in the neighborhood didn't care, that police didn't care, and that crime was generally tolerated. In neighborhoods with broken windows and graffitied walls, law-abiding people move away or become afraid. Old folks like Ms. Edna withdraw behind locked doors and social control breaks down. Proponents of broken windows theory argued that criminal subcultures were allowed to flourish, tax-paying law-abiding people continue to flee, and the severity of crimes escalate. It's sort of a snowball effect. The answer, according to broken windows theory, was a style of policing that, rather than prioritizing serious crimes and letting petty crimes slide, focused instead on the perpetrators of petty crimes, since they were viewed as a catalyst in a larger chain reaction. The theory itself gained extraordinary traction. Many police departments adopted so-called broken windows policing, and George Kelling, one of the authors studied here, was actually hired as a consultant by the New York City Transit Authority. As an outgrowth of broken windows policing, departments began to put more officers on the street looking for evidence of those low-level crimes. Many departments began heavily engaging in so-called stop-and-frisk policies, which empowered police to stop and question people if they felt there was a reasonable suspicion that the person was engaging in a criminal activity. In this case, the police may then perform a frisk or pat-down search of their bodies and clothes, also called a Terry search after the Supreme Court case ruling on its legality, if they reasonably believe you may be armed or dangerous. Stop and frisk and broken windows policing were controversial because the legal bar for reasonable suspicion may, in practice, be quite low, and because racial and ethnic minorities tend to get stopped and searched disproportionate to their population share. Analysis of pedestrian stops in New York City, for example, which adopted this poly policy heavily, found that black men were stopped at about eight times the rate of white men, and Hispanic men also faced elevated risk. However, black men were the least likely to be found with contraband, things like weapons or drugs, of all groups in the study. The so-called hit rate refers to the percentage of times a police search discovers contraband. The hit rate for black men in this data set was about 13%. The group with the highest hit rate was white women at about 20%. Now, that doesn't mean that 20% of white women in New York City were carrying drugs or guns at any given time. What it probably meant was that for a white woman to be stopped and searched in the first place, she had to be acting pretty shady. Whereas minority men complained of being frequently stopped for no obvious reason at all. This policy of policing had other tragic outcomes. In 2014, New York City resident Eric Garner was suffocated to death by New York Police Department officers utilizing an illegal chokehold. Gardner pleaded for his life, despite telling officers who were compressing his neck and putting pressure on his chest that he couldn't breathe 11 times before he finally lost consciousness. Officers then left him on the ground without aid for seven minutes while waiting for an ambulance to arrive. Given the violent force used in apprehending Gardner, you may assume he was under suspicion of being dangerous or for the commission of a violent crime, but no. He was being questioned for a nonviolent, likely misdemeanor offense of selling single, untaxed cigarettes. Before being placed in the chokehold, a video shows Gardner complaining to the police of being constantly stopped and harassed. The medical examiner ruled Gardner's death a homicide, but the grand jury still refused to indict the arresting officer, Daniel Pantaleo, though the New York City Police Department did fire him in response to public pressure five years later. In a more controversial take on crime, some functionalists argue that crime may continue because it can help society function better, meaning sometimes crime, or the process of defining some kind of human activity as a crime, has positive social functions. Number one, and most obvious, crime is a big job creator. 
Some people engage in crime because they perceive that there are no other legitimate ways of supporting themselves. This is covered in my theory lecture segment on street gangs. But also, classifying certain human behaviors as a crime creates work opportunities on the other side of the law as well. When you have crime, you need police officers, lawyers and judges, parole officers, prison guards, social workers, the list goes on and on. During the massive job loss caused by deindustrialization in the United States, when all our factories shuttered and began moving overseas, many struggling communities lobbied for federal, state, or local funds to build prisons instead. A prison requires a lot of people to run it, and it was a way of putting people back to work. Durkheim also argued that defining certain kinds of behavior as crime helps society in other ways. Creating a scary common enemy, the bad guy, the deviant, helps bond the rest of society together. There's nothing like hating on someone to bring people together and make them feel good about themselves. Finally, signaling someone out as a criminal and punishing him is a good way to establish social norms and encourage everyone else to step in line. The idea that locking people up can create revenue goes farther than just creating jobs. For-profit, corporate, or privately run prisons, sometimes also called contract prisons, are a pretty big business in the United States. Traditionally, jails and prisons, as well as immigration detention facilities, were run by state, local, or federal governments. But a for-profit prison is run by a corporation, same as Nike or Pepsi. But instead of making money by selling shoes or soda, they do it by locking people up and charging money to taxpayers to provide the service. The move to privatize public services like corrections is partially spurred in the United States by distrust in government. The belief that pretty much anything can be run better if outsourced to the private sector is a cornerstone of the modern conservative movement in the United States. The use of private prison facilities varies by locality. They are controversial and some states don't use them at all, while others, like Montana, rely on them to house up to half of all inmates. President Joe Biden issued an executive order to phase out the use of privately run prisons for the housing of people in federal penitentiaries, but the Department of Homeland Security, which oversees immigration enforcement, still heavily relies on them. An average of 28,289 people reside in immigration detention facilities on any given day, for example, and an estimated 78% of those are run by private prison companies. Unlike people in other prisons, most immigrant detainees have not been charged or convicted of any felony. Instead, they are merely being detained, awaiting either an immigration hearing or deportation. Unlike with criminal charges, where you have a right to a public defender if you can't afford one, people facing deportation do not get taxpayer-funded legal defense if they can't afford to hire a private attorney, which can make them especially vulnerable. In her 2017 book, researcher Lauren Brooke Eisen noted that the private prison industry in the United States was then generating about $5 billion in revenue every single year. Because locking people up is lucrative, these companies also spend money lobbying. In 2016 and 2017, private prison companies spent a reported $12.4 million lobbying state lawmakers alone. Lobbying in this case refers to campaign contributions and other reported gifts to politicians, and it's a reality of our political system. It can incentivize lawmakers' voting behavior as well. If you receive a check for half a million dollars in campaign contributions from a company via a PAC, for example, you might tend to vote for policies favorable to them or else they won't donate for your re-election. The question becomes, what kind of policies are private prison companies lobbying for? Well, sometimes they're trying to persuade politicians to outsource the running of more local, state, or federal detention facilities to their companies, or to pass other laws that allow them to expand the number of facilities they operate, or run them in the way that they like. However, if you make money from locking people up, you might lobby for other kinds of stuff too, like tougher crime and immigration policies. This letter sent by private prison corporation CCA, which is still the biggest player in contract prisons, but it now goes by the name Core Civic, was sent to company shareholders in 2014. A shareholder is someone who owns company stock and makes money when the company does. This is the text. The demand for our facilities and services could be adversely affected by the relaxation of enforcement efforts, 
leniency in conviction or parole standards and sentencing practices, or through the decriminalization of certain activities that are currently proscribed, means prohibited, by our criminal laws. For instance, any changes with respect to drugs and controlled substances or illegal immigration could affect the number of persons arrested, convicted, and sentenced, thereby potentially reducing demand for correctional facilities to house them. This is formal and vague language, but it's not that hard to parse. What they're saying is, if your state decides to legalize cannabis, for example, or the federal government decides to offer amnesty to undocumented immigrants, we will have less people to lock up. Less people to lock up means we will make less money, which you, our shareholder, will also make less money. So maybe call your senator and tell them to vote against any measure that would drive prison populations down. The evidence is actually mixed on whether private prison construction alone has the power to explain state-level variations in incarceration rates. But research by Poiker and Dipple found a modest correlation between private prison construction and the length of inmate sentences. But allowing people to make a lot of money from mass imprisonment offers some very perverse incentives, which brings us to the Cash for Kids scandal. In 2008, two Pennsylvania judges, Michael Conahan and Mark Chavarella, were convicted of taking money from a local privately run juvenile justice facility run by a company called PA Child Care. For each minor child they sentenced to serve time there. That's what it sounds like. Every time they, as the sitting judge in a juvenile case, sent a kid to the local juvenile detention center, the private company that ran it paid them an illegal kickback. The money they were earning, which is believed to have totaled around $2.6 million, heavily incentivized both men to hand down shockingly harsh sentences for minor juvenile crimes. One victim, Hillary Transu, shown here, was jailed for three months after making and posting a MySpace page making fun of her school's assistant principal. The charge was harassment. At the time of this recording, she was, has been long set free, has a master's degree, and now advocates for juvenile justice reform. Both judges were convicted and sentenced to lengthy prison terms themselves, though Conahan was released on furlough to home confinement during the COVID-19 pandemic. Privately run prisons and detention centers are controversial for many of the reasons we've already covered, and others too. Opponents highlight the generally worse health and safety records of these facilities, which are often overcrowded and run on shoestring budgets. That's because the only way to make corrections more cost-effective is by cutting back somewhere. Prisons aren't luxury institutions to begin with, but you can cut what exists. Getting rid of college and vocational technical classes, counseling services, scaling back on medical care, staffing clinics with nursing assistants instead of doctors, for example, scaling back on the cost of food, crowding the facilities with more people, um, or cutbacks in staffing. Private prisons and detention facilities often employ fewer guards who are paid less and also trained less. Unfortunately, there is evidence that those kinds of cutbacks lead to more safety violations. A 2016 Department of Justice report found that contract prisons had more security violations and more assaults of inmates on staff, inmates on each other, and more staff on inmate abuse too. It also found more reported human rights violations in contract prisons, such as prisoners without disciplinary records being sentenced to long-term solitary confinement. The situation in immigration detention facilities are particularly bad for other reasons. Immigration detention facilities are often far away from major cities. Immigrants don't have the same rights to counsel for deportation hearings that you would for a misdemeanor or felony. Um, as non-citizens, Americans tend to unfortunately pay less attention, um, and immigrants often have limited English, which can make it more difficult for them to communicate with the outside world or advocate for themselves. Because providing health care is such a major cost for any prison or detention facility, it is one place where such facilities look to cut costs. For example, Clinics may be understaffed or staffed only with LPNs, licensed professional nurses, 
who receive much less training than RNs or doctors and are usually not empowered to make diagnoses, let alone prescribe treatments. The result is that dangerous medical conditions are undiagnosed and untreated with potentially deadly results. ICE de detention facilities, the majority of which are outsourced to private prison companies, saw 52 reported deaths between 2017 and 2021. A report by the American Civil Liberties Union and Physicians for Human Rights reviewed those deaths in a 2024 report and found that as many as 95% of them were either preventable or possibly preventable had detainees had access to appropriate medical care. The case of Melvin Ariel Can Calero Mendoza is one such illustration. A 39-year-old asylum seeker and father of two from Nicaragua who died in ICE custody from an untreated pulmonary embolism, a blockage of blood flow to the lungs, after complaining of symptoms for weeks. Calero Mendoza was examined two weeks before his death by a nurse who noted that he reported severe pain, his blood pressure was elevated, his blood oxygen level was below normal, and there were painful areas of his, of his leg that were, quote, warm to the touch. Those symptoms are consistent with the presence of a potentially dangerous blood clot. In an ER, such a patient would have been given an ultrasound and put on blood thinners, thus potentially saving his life. But Calero Mendoza's records did not indicate that any further action was taken until he collapsed and detention center staff called 911. Unfortunately, for Calero Mendoza, it was too late. Using incarceration as a wealth or job generating strategy can both help to explain high imprisonment rates and also illustrate the functionalist perspective on crime in action. It's also the very definition of what some activists and scholars have come to term the quote prison industrial complex, a way of describing this use of imprisonment to solve not just crime, but also economic problems or to generate wealth. By the way, just because something functions in society doesn't mean that it's good. It just indicates that mass incarceration may be harder to end the more people that benefit from it. This concludes this specific lecture on the sociological perspectives on crime, though sociological perspectives on crime are more varied than this and will be explored in other lectures as well. Thank you for listening.